today we're finishing up this series on churchmanship. And uh, in, in a way, uh, a while back, uh, Ron preached a sermon series on repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. And uh, so th- if you didn't listen to those, I encourage you to go back and listen to those. Uh, and this, what we're talking about this morning, ties in not only with what we have talked about already in this churchmanship series and God uh, giving leaders to the church and the responsibility between the, the leaders and the people in um, our, our uh, accountability or responsibilities to one another as uh, covenant members, the value of church membership, all of those things that we've talked about uh, kind of come to a uh, culmination point in Matthew 18, sort of an inflection point in Matthew 18. And uh, as church members this morning, the whole idea is we are accountable to one another. As church members, we are accountable to one another, and we are accountable for one another. Uh, The church exercises the keys of the kingdom, and to be a Christian is to be part of the family of God, which is expressed in local congregations, and part of being a member, part of being a part of a local congregation is being accountable to one another and accountable for one another as followers of Christ together. And uh, all of this means that as we think of our accountability to one another, we are not just thinking in some sort of weird, abstract, hands-off terms. As we'll see this morning, what we're dealing with in Matthew 18 is really aimed at helping one another grow in Christ-likeness and continue in progress in the faith. And, and which means that there should be, for a Christian, a growing sense of sanctification, a growing sense of the holiness of God, and a growing sense of our imaging Him through the power of the Spirit at work in our lives as we are conformed to Him, His image. It, 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 It means that Christianity and the gospel is not an excuse to sin. A lot of times we get this idea. like We love grace and good and right that we do. Grace is a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And we are saved by grace through faith alone, right? I I am 100% on board with the five solas. I am 100% on board with the recovery of the gospel in the Reformation, saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, alone, for the glory of God alone, but that glory of God alone peace is part of it too. Um, for by grace you have been saved, this is not of your own doing, not of your own works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in. What then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin continue to walk in it? If your brother wanders... From the truth, go and get him. You see how that accountability piece comes in. It's accountability before God, accountability to and for one another. Um, Ultimately, what we're talking about this morning is, is commonly called church discipline. And the process of church discipline is a process whereby God has ordained for church members to be accountable to one another and accountable for one another. And church dif- discipline can be difficult. We don't even like that term. You're probably, like, there's probably some people that are like, yeah, when you say the term church discipline. Um, listen, in our culture, there are parents that refuse to discipline children. God is not a father like that, as we will see. He's a, he's a loving father who does discipline his children because he loves them. And, and that discipline is for our good. And so I understand that there is a reluctance even to practice church discipline, but what we need to consider also is we often find that the things that God means to bring life and flourishing are difficult and require faith in a broken world. The difficulty of it and the challenge of it is not an excuse to not do it, is what I'm saying. Um, and so what we'll see this morning is there are, there's a clear process, there's a clear goal, and there is a clear authority in church discipline. 
And it is difficult, but in the end, it comes down to submission to God's instruction because we have faith that he is good and he knows what he's doing. So this is the word of the Lord this morning from Matthew 18, verses 15 to 21. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established on the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you a Gentile, as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. This is the word the Lord has for us this morning, and it is eternally true. First point this morning, the process of church discipline. The process of church discipline. Discipline is training. That's what the word means. Okay, so there's two forms or two ways in which discipline happens. There's formative discipline, and then there's corrective discipline. So we often think of discipline only in the corrective sense. And to be fair, that is the sense in which it is being used Uh, here in Matthew 18. But before we jump into that, I want to highlight the fact that there is a process of formative discipline that happens all the time within the church. And that is uh, training through instruction into maturity that forms a unique Christian culture. Okay? The word is padia. It it, it is... uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, fathers don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in the discipline and admonition of the Lord, the padia of the Lord. And the idea is that this is formative as well, uh, as well as corrective. And so the formative way that discipline happens is through preaching, teaching, teaching speaking the truth to one another in love in such a way that we are Uh, taught, instructed, growing, maturing, and being conformed to the image of Christ so that more and more the culture among his people is a culture that reflects the truth of God's word, right? That's the formative discipline. Um, Christ modeled this throughout his ministry with his disciples. How often was he going about teaching and then conversing with his disciples, and that was shaping their understanding, their worldview, and how they related to one another. But the second form of church discipline is the one that's highlighted here, and that's corrective. And there's a process that Christ lays out for us to follow. Now, we need to get this. We need to think about this. Jonathan Lehman points out that there are a few guidelines that are helpful in determining when to address and how quickly to move through these steps. The first one is the sin is outward. So in other words, I mean, this is just really uh, common sense. You can't tell what's going on in somebody's heart. You can't see inward sin. We can observe outward sin. And, And you know a tree by its fruit, and a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And so in other words, we're actually to be involved in looking at one another's lives. So the first thing we we need to to cover before we jump into this process is like a big misunderstanding where we take the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 and then apply it universally to all things, like judge not. Well, that's dumb because we are to judge. In fact, in that very chapter, he talks about judging false teachers. He talks about knowing people by their fruit. In other words, we're to judge with right judgment is how Christ puts it. We're, we're, we're not to judge wrongly in an unrighteous way. We're to judge rightly in a righteous way that reflects God and his character. And when we see something going on, we need to address it. So we see that right here in the text. If, when you, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him, to his, tell him his fault. So there's this outward element. It's, a, it's an outward sin. It's, it's manifested. It's observable. It's... The second thing that Lehman points out is the seriousness. So this is another thing that's hard for us because not all sins are in the same plane. They're not in the same plane as far as their severity, and they're not in the same plane as far as their consequence and their impact. There are some sins that, uh, think about it this way. In the Old Testament, there are, there are the, the Old Testament law had provisions for how to deal with different sins, Right? 
it, there, like if, if you're if you accidentally or if you go and and take your neighbor's this, then you do this in return, right? There, there's also varying degrees of severity for the punishment that comes from that or the consequence that comes from that. So not all sins are on the same plane. There are some sins that are more serious, more severe, more consequential as far as uh, how it affects us, how it affects others. Um, and so all sins are equal in the sense of they all separate us from a holy God. But not all sins are equal in our rejection of the holy God's design. We see that in Romans chapter 1. Clearly, clearly there are sins listed out in Romans chapter 1 that are the culmination of their rejection of God and more serious in their consequence. So the outward, it's got to be the seriousness. And then the, the third thing is unrepentant. In other words, if there is repentance, you don't keep pressing this beyond that. There's, right? Repentance is the goal. That's the aim. If repentance happens, good. It, it's accomplished what it, what it is, is intended to do, as we saw. So um, it's, it, we deal with outward in, in relation to its seriousness. And, and some things are just immaturity, right? Some things are not. And so if, if it's harming a relationship or harming the person, we need to confront them and then unrepentance. So the first step here in Matthew 18 is found in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go one-on-one -on -one and talk in person, telling them their fault and calling them to repentance. That's the first step in this process. And, and listen, if they repent, the process stops. That's the goal. We'll come back to that. By way of application, I mean, this one's, I don't need to explain this one much, much more. Like, go tell your brother. Like, go talk to him. By way of application, though, we need to maybe clarify a couple things. So first of all, um, the obligation is for you to go to talk to that person, not other people. Okay, really important that we get this. If your brother sins against you, look at what, look at verse 15. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So often when we are sinned against, we are tempted to start to build a coalition without even really intending to. We tend to go to other people rather than to the person that has sinned against us. And, and we experience this as pastors. We have people come to us and say, hey, so-and-so did this. And I, I can tell you, our answer is always, 100% of the time, going to be, have you talked to them? We are going to point you back to them. I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going to abide that. Right? I'm, that's not being a faithful shepherd if I'm saying, well, here, tell me all about it. Let's talk about this. And not even, that's, that's unjust. It's not even like, uh, it's not even bad shepherding. It's just unjust. It's taking uh, a my word versus their word, which we'll see in a moment, is not how this whole thing works anyway. You have a responsibility to go tell this person who has sinned against you, go to them face to face, which is the second point of application, which in our world, don't text. Don't text them about it. Don't, don't use emoticons to try to communicate your, your state of emotional angst. Don't, don't email if you can help it, don't call. There's this crazy thing. Crazy. It's, I know. Some of, some of you younger people are really going to struggle with this. You used to just sit down and talk to one another. Like face to face. It's a crazy thing because you can see one another's expressions. And I'm not talking Zoom. It's not face to face. I mean like in person. If, if you have been sinned against, you have a responsibility to go to that person and talk to them and do it face to face, not through text, not through email, because stuff gets lost in that. You know, all these people online are really tough when, when, when they're online and really timid when they're in person, right? It, it, we, you have a responsibility to go talk to this person one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, do it personally. But if they don't listen, if they do listen, process ends. That's it. If they don't listen, though, you take it to step number two, which is to take two or three others with you. And this phrase, uh, that all things may be established, 
on the evidence of two or three witnesses is taken directly from Deuteronomy 19. And the aim, hear me on this, the aim in this is to protect people against false accusations. So it's very easy if the issue is not able to be resolved between the two people individually for it to completely devolve into he said, she said. My word versus their word. And, And as Christians, we care about truth. We care about justice. And so the process is not like, hey, build a coalition over here. I'm gonna start building a coalition over here. We're gonna duke it out. That's actually how church splits happen. That's how division happens. That's how all sorts of nonsense happens. The process is actually, listen, if we can't resolve it, and if, if, if there's sin and, and, and the person confronted is not repentant, then I'm going to go get two or three other people so that it's not just my word against theirs. It's actually... There, there's a, a, an investigation is the context of Deuteronomy chapter 19. The witness needs to be able to confirm the accusation are actually true and there's actual sin. They need to be able to confirm the seriousness of this outward sin and the person being confronted is in fact not repentant. And the hope is that by involving others, the issue might be able to be resolved And, listen to this, either either discover that the person being confronted is not guilty or that the one confronted might come to his sense and repent, right? The the issue with bringing two or three witnesses is to get to the truth and to establish that truth, not just in one person's word versus another, but in two or three. Now, This is really important. These first two steps, they might take several meetings. It might take time. And it's up to the parties involved, the time and progress and how fast this moves as they deem prudent. We always, I I would say as a general rule, we always want to err on the side of slowness rather than haste when it comes to an issue of sin, just generally speaking. Now, certainly there are some things that are so damaging to the reputation of Christ and the church. We'll come to that in a moment. They need to be dealt with quickly. There, I mean, there is, there is no contestation. There is no doubt that this is wrong. There's no doubt that they did it. And it is very public, very serious, very, and it needs to be dealt with immediately. But as a general rule, it should be a slow moving process to give room for the Holy Spirit to convict that person because the aim is always reconciliation and repentance. And maybe we discover along the process and we are convicted of the fact that maybe this is less significant than I thought it was. And maybe this is one of those things where love can cover a multitude of sins and I don't need to pursue this anymore. Right? This, this is as much for the person that has been sinned against as it is for the person who does the sinning. Or perhaps, as has happened with me, it takes a little minute, a hot minute, for me to get over my initial uh, crummy reaction to being confronted and looking in a mirror and being faced with my own sin. And it takes a hot minute for the Holy Spirit to work on my heart and humble me to the point where I'm actually able to see it and recognize it and admit it. Right? So, slow burn. Going slow with the process is not bad. Now, notice also, up to this point, the circle of involvement is incredibly low. Here we are at step two, halfway through this process, and there are four people that know about it. The person who has sinned, the person who's been sinned against, and two to three other people. So four to five people know about this. Ideally, issues should be resolved with very few people even knowing about it. In other words, church discipline should be happening all the time throughout the congregation, and most of us should be unaware of it. It's important that we understand that because we often jump to step four is what church discipline is and ignore steps one and two. And in steps one or two, listen, elders might not even know about it. This is our responsibility because we are accountable to one another and for one another, right? And, and there's also a responsibility in that to 
guard our tongues and not have loose lips and become gossips about this if we're involved in it. The aim is restoration and care for a brother or sister. And one of the ways that you can derail this and one of the ways you can not care for a brother or sister is by going and talking about it. Rather than recognizing the responsibility that comes at this point by being a part of it. Circle small. Keep it to yourself. Pray for the person. And pray that there's restoration. Also notice that this whole process up to this point protects both the accused and the accuser. It's aimed at determining truth and keeping it from devolving into division and argument and bickering. And the aim is always to determine truth. Now, if the person repents after step two, it's over. If not, though, step three is verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The instruction here is to take it to the church. Now, before we jump into this step, I just want to highlight again how this ties in with church membership. This process makes zero sense apart from some way of determining who the church that these, these per people are accountable to is and who they aren't. That was a weird sentence. Let me try to say that again. This process makes no sense if there's no such thing as a defined church that you take it to and which you are a part of, okay? I said before, when we were talking about church membership, what is it, if we just say, oh, well, the church is universal, which yes, there is a universal church. I agree with that. We can talk about that. But if we just say, oh, the universal church is all there you're a member of. You don't have to be a member of the local church. All right, we're gonna, if it comes to this, we're gonna put this out on Twitter. Or we'll put this out on Facebook. We'll just send it out to the universal church and let everybody determine, right? No, that's not how Christ is thinking. He's not having a town crier come in like, everybody in the, re the region of Ephesus, gather around. We're going to talk about this guy's sin. No, it's a local congregation. It's, a, it's, it's people that know this person. It's people that are involved in their lives. And we'll see that in a moment. And if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go watch that because we value church membership and church membership is important. And we want you to be a member of this church. And if you don't want to be a member of this church, we want you to be a member of a church. Because things like this don't happen without membership. Without accountability, formal declaration of accountability to one another. So telling it to the church means a local gathering of believers that are covenanted together and some, some principles need to be applied here. I think, number one, elders should oversee this as they are given the charge of overseeing the church. Now, the elder might not even be involved up to this point, but the elders should ensure that the process at this point, when it goes before the church, is done in a way where they can stand and they can give an account and it's done the right way, with the right attitude. Which means that while the person who was sinned against might be the one to tell the church because of their firsthand knowledge, knowledge, it should be done under the oversight of the elders. So it's done orderly and it's done rightly. Secondly, in telling it to the church, enough information should be given, but not too much. The aim is not to embarrass or slander or uh, drag somebody through the mud. The aim is always restoration. And so the church needs to know the nature of the sin and that the preceding steps have taken place as well as the outcome of those steps. But the church does not need to know every single gory little detail. We also don't want others to stumble by going into graphic detail. third principle in telling it to the church is the witnesses from the first two steps should confirm that the fact, what the facts are so that it is not just one person's word against another. In other words, the person might tell it to the church and then the witnesses might come up and uh, the one or two witnesses in step two might come up and be like, yes, we affirm that that's true. We took this process. We sat down. We had this conversation. We called for repentance and this was the response. Part of the reason for two or three witnesses in the last step is that if it comes to number three and we have to tell it to the church, it's not baseless. It's not a vendetta. It's not this person against this person. It's established. And the church can then hear the nature 
and the outcome without needing to know the details because there are other people that have been involved that can say, yes, this is true. And this is a huge pitfall that we can fall into. This could very easily turn into a gossip ring. And we all need to guard our hearts and our lips. In, this, in these cases, there are certain things that the membership at large just does not need to know. And, and, and in part, because it might actually hinder the restoration process, right? Like, I'll be honest with you. I have friends that are pastors that tell their wives everything. That's ridiculous. I don't tell my wife everything. I love her. I trust her. She is my other half. I don't tell her everything because number one, I don't want to burden her with those things. And number two, I don't want to cause an undue barrier if an issue gets resolved that would cause conflict or tension between her and this other person in relationship. The same principle applies in being wise and limiting in the information that is shared publicly to the church. And again, this comes back to the nature and the seriousness of, of what's being accused. And, and people will always have questions that will not be answered. And this, again, highlights the importance of those two or three witnesses. And then finally, the final principle for telling it to the congregation is the congregation needs to be given time to reach out to this person and to encourage them to repent and be restored to the fellowship of the body. So at this point, it's already been established that there has been sin and that sin has not been repented of. And in this conversation that takes place, as church members, we need to be careful not to get sucked into an attempt to spin the story or divide the body uh, or the person accused against the body or, or any of that stuff. This could very easily turn into division. And remember, we have two or three witnesses along under the, uh, under the oversight of the elders that have brought this to the church because the process has been followed. At that point, our responsibility is to trust that the process has been followed and that those two or three witnesses uh, have done their due diligence. This has been done biblically and, uh, and confirmed by the elders. And so the call is a call to repent. It's not a call to discuss and, and try to sort it out. It's already been sorted out, right? And the reason for the involvement of the church is one of the final steps since it has already been established and confirmed with impartial witnesses. It's like the last ditch effort to bring them back. This is not something that should be taken lightly. This is not something that should be done hastily. This is not something that should be done without a significant amount of prayer and consideration because the final step is after that time, if they have not turned, if they have not repented, after the body has reached out and, ple and pleaded, ple pleaded, pled, pleaded, something, you know what I mean, H have appealed to them passionately for their repentance, the final step is formal exclusion from the fellowship of the body, excommunication. We see that in the end of verse 18. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. This one people do not like. We do not like the word excommunication. We do not like the idea of excluding somebody. This highlights part of what it means, though, to be a part of a body. Does it not? It highlights what it means to be a part of the body. It means to be in fellowship with the people of God as part of the covenant people of God. And if this process gets to that point, it demonstrates that they are not in fellowship with the body, they are not in fellowship with God, and they are not part of the covenant people of God. We'll come back to that in a minute. I mean, isn't that not, is that not what we do in communion when we celebrate today? We're saying... We have fellowship, koinonia, with one another and with God. We celebrate the covenant renewal meal as the covenant people brought together by, by God in a common faith and in fellowship with one another. And it's serious because in this final step, the church is saying, you have shown by your unrepentant attitude that you are not one of us. That's serious. That's weighty. But that's what this is talking about. 
for right now, we'll come back to this in just a moment, but for right now, it means that the person is removed from membership, that they are excluded from the Lord's Supper, and are treated as someone outside of God's covenant people. This is not Amish shunning, okay? This is not like, hey, we're never talking to you again until you get your crud together. It is, no, we're treating you like an unbeliever. We're going to share the gospel with you. We even want you to come to church to hear the truth of God's word. But we do not recognize you as a believer. You are excluded from the Lord's table. You are not part of the fellowship of the body. You are an outsider who needs the gospel and needs to repent. And all of this is not only for their good, because the aim still at this point is restoration and repentance. Okay, you'll see that in a minute when we look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But the aim in all of this is their good and the sake of the purity of the local church, the sake of the reputation of Christ's name. In fact, it's a, in the opening chapters of Revelation, we see that Christ rebukes the church at Thyatira for tolerating immorality in the congregation and not dealing with it. That leads to the next point. There is an authority in church discipline. So that's the process of church discipline. Next, there is an authority in church discipline. Verses 18 to 20. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. Verse 18, the church, when this happens, is exercising the keys of the kingdom. Remember when Peter confessed Christ and he said, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail upon it or prevail against it. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's Matthew 16, just a few chapters earlier. Here, the church, now notice this is not a pope. This is not a cardinal. This is tell it to the church. And if they don't listen to them, then let him be to you, plural, as in a tax collector and a Gentile. In other words, the church is exercising the keys of the kingdom by binding and loosing. This is significant. We come together and this process happens. It is passing sentence. It is acting as agents of the kingdom with kingdom authority that has been delegated to us by Christ. And then verse 19 to 20, the church handing this down, handing down the sentence is them saying as agents of the king of the kingdom, what, ha- what, what the king has already said. Okay, that's kind of how it, how it pans out. It's like, we're not making this up. This process has been followed. We are saying, on behalf of the king, this is the sentence. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in uh, Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And then Christ says this amazing thing where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. Now, this is important. What is the context of verse 20? It is church discipline. This is very specific and narrow in meaning, and it is massive in implication. When two or three are gathered in his name to pronounce this, Christ is there with them, spiritually present in an authoritative sense, affirming what they are saying. This doesn't mean when you get together with two or three Christian friends, Christ is there as if somehow he isn't, present when you're alone. It doesn't mean that he's not present spiritually among us in worship unless we're getting to this point in church discipline. We have the continued presence of Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who lives in our lives as the third person of the Trinity proceeds from the Father and from the Son. Christ himself promised that he would be with us always, even until the end of the age. This has a very specific meaning that we need to apply and understand rightly. He is saying that when we do this, Christ is confirming and upholding what we have done as the one who has all authority and who can delegate the authority to bind and loose. It's massively important because what is being said is nothing less than 
there is an assurance of God's blessing on the appropriate and biblical action taken in trying to reconcile believers to one another. And that brings us briefly to the goal of church discipline. The goal is always repentance and restoration. Always. First Corinthians, hey, listen, there's this guy among you that is uh, participating in sin that even the Gentiles blush at, and you're tolerating it. What is Paul's advice? What does he say? Well, it's not advice. It's, it's a command. Put him out. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Protect the purity of the church. And then in 2 Corinthians, it's really interesting. He's talking about this guy that's repented, and he's like, welcome him back. And most scholars agree that the guy in 2 Corinthians is the same guy from 1 Corinthians. In other words, church discipline had its intended result in the repentance, and he's admonishing him like, hey, don't hold it against the guy. Bring him back. Welcome him back. It was all about that to begin with. That's the aim, right? He talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander, that they might be handed over Satan, that they can learn not to blaspheme against God. The aim is not their destruction, but the salvation. Really important that we understand this. Church discipline has as its first goal the restoration of a wayward sinner. In other words, we are instruments of God's grace in the lives of other believers that he has joined us to, and he has placed us in a body for our good and our protection and our growth and progress in the faith. And this accountability to one another and for one another is essential for that to happen. Because otherwise... It's just me and Jesus, whatever, man. It doesn't matter. I just do what I want. Who are you to tell me anything? Right? You don't know me, man. Like, what are you talking about? You can't do that. This is why it works in the context of church membership, because in church membership, we've said, yes, you can do that. In fact, I want you to do that. I'm expecting you to do that, and I will do that for you, too. See, that's how the whole thing works. The aim is always restoration, the easiest way to fall into sin without a chance of correction and loving rebuke is to isolate oneself from the life of uh, the church and the fellowship of other Christians. Galatians 6.1, if anyone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore them with the spirit of gentleness, taking care lest you fall into sin. A loving correction or rebuke is God's grace in the life of a believer who is wandering. The second goal is that we might be assured that we are his children. I'll just leave this to you. You can go to Hebrews chapter 12, read the first half of Hebrews chapter 12. God disciplines those that are his. If they're left without discipline, they're illegitimate children. So the fact that we're being disciplined by one another under the authority of God's word and, and that, that this is the exercise of the keys of the kingdom means that when we repent, it actually shows that we're legit children of God. It gives us some basis for confidence in that because not only did he discipline us, but the discipline had its intended effect. And the final goal of church discipline is the reputation of Christ. Now that shows up in two ways. First of all, the reputation of Christ is upheld in that he forgives sinners. Right? The, the issue here is not that we're all going to live life perfectly. The issue here is that we're accountable to one another and accountable for one another. And when we repent, he always forgives. He always restores over and over and over because that restoration and that forgiveness was purchased on the cross and affirmed in the resurrection and is ours as his people. This is God's means of grace that he might display his grace to the world and to one another. And so when we repent, we're actually demonstrating that Jesus is who he says he is and he does what he says he does and his grace is sufficient and that it is truly forgiven. That's just like 1 John. One nine, But we also uphold the reputation of Christ in that he's holy and righteous and that we're to be holy and righteous because he is. That his church is to be marked by his character. That his people that claim him as Lord are to live under his lordship. It also upholds the gospel as not being cheap grace, right? Just believe this, you can do whatever you want. That's not the gospel. This gospel is not a profession of faith that punches your ticket and you can live however you want. Truth faith produces 
changed lives and changed hearts and changed dispositions and changed trajectories, it validates the transformational power of the gospel when this process happens and when we respond in humble submission to it. So let me just say very clearly, church discipline is not have the aim of putting people out of the church. Even though it might come to that, that's not the aim. That's not the goal. Church discipline does not have the aim of getting even or some sort of retribution or taking sides. Church discipline does not have the goal of some sort of hypocritical self-exaltation, like, oh, man, look how bad that person is. Thank goodness I'm not that, like that. In fact, we might do well and should apply what Christ says about the log and the speck before we ever even go and confront our brother in their sin, right? First, take the log out of your own eyes so that you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. There's lots of heart work that needs to be done before we ever go to the person and confront them. So this is not some sort of hypocritical self-exaltation. We're to go with the right heart, right motive. And finally, the aim and goal of church discipline is not vilifying somebody because they don't hold to our convictions or practices in a way that we like where there are matters of Christian freedom. You don't just get to go and I think you're in sin because I don't do it that way. We're talking about clear, explicit commands or prohibitions from Scripture, not like, hey, listen, I spank for that and you don't. You need to repent, right? We need to be real careful with that. So the process of church discipline is small circles expanding as needed, and it starts with one-on-one confrontation. We see that there is an authority of church discipline where the church is acting as God's agent on earth, and we see that there's a goal of church discipline, which is restoration and repentance. So we need to trust God's wisdom rather than our own and seek to honor him by being accountable to one another as members of Arbor Drive and being accountable for other members of Arbor Drive for the sake of his name, for the sake of his glory, and for the good and progress in the faith of one another as brothers and sisters.